Now, Russian President Vladimir Putin is making his annual address to the Federal Assembly. It comes just days before the first anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine. Let's take a listen in. And um, I would remind you that uh, in 2014, Kiev regime uh, put all their resources with uh, military weapons and tanks um, to the area of Donbass. In 2015, they started again an attempt to direct Donbass directly, besieging them and terrorizing uh, people living there. And all of that contradicted the agreed uh, resolutions and uh, agreements in place. I would like to repeat that they started this war and we use all our strength to stop it. Those who planned a new attack in uh, Donbass, in uh, Lugansk, Donetsk, they were going to strike Crimea next, and we knew about it. We knew about uh, their plans, and uh, in Kyiv, uh, they now uh, say about it openly. We knew it anyway. We defend our country, our people, and um, the West already spent $150 billion for supporting Kyiv regime. And G7 allocated only $60 billion for supporting poor countries. Uh, so you know what I mean. Uh, they spent $150 billion uh, for supporting uh, military actions in Ukraine, but only $60 million to support poor countries to fight poverty or to develop uh, ecology, where all of this um, good work disappeared. And uh, they keep putting funds into um, uh, fueling this war. Recently, at the Munich conference, um, they repetitively uh, accused us um, in order to ensure that um, uh, the whole world forgets what the West has done over the last 10 years. They let the gene out of the bottle. The genie out of the bottom, they left ago. And we didn't make out um, all those um, data figures that we have. And um, about 38 million people became refugees now. They just want to erase it from uh, the memory of humanity, uh, trying to make it out like nothing happened, but nobody forgot what happened with the um, human losses and tragedies. And, of course, they just try to use these principles of democracy and freedom in order to defend their uh, in fact, totalitarian uh, values. And they just try to uh, distract people's attention from uh, corruption scandals. You can see it um, on the news all the time, uh, to distract people from economic and social problems and contradictions and difficulties. I will remind you uh, that um, uh, the West opened the way for Nazism in the um, uh, 1930s. <coughs> and people who know a little bit, at least, about history, they know that it goes uh, back into 19th century, um, back to um, Austro-Hungarian Empire and Poland, and they tried to take those um, uh, territories that are today called Ukrainian 
they were trying to take those territories from us. So it's nothing new, really. They supported the coup d'etat in 2014. That was a bloody coup d'etat, and they made it out like nothing happened. They even uh, informed us how much money they spent. And they put some... Um, this hatred for all Russian into this um, attitude. And they call us names and uh, they blamed us um, as comparing us to um, Hitler's actions. And uh, they use this um, um, Shahraich and other notions for Ukrainian military tanks and equipment. They use um, this uh, uh, Nazi signs. It's unbelievable that um, nobody in uh, the Western countries um, realizes or uh, notices this. And why? Because they don't care. I'm sorry, but they care only about fighting us, the Russian people. As long as they uh, fight Russia, they use anyone. Neo-Nazis, they, they can use uh, um, devil himself um, so that um, they just fight Russia. And to Russia project is created to set up um, uh, different conflicts. And back then in 1930s, and now the only aim was to um, start the war in Europe with uh, somebody else's hands and get rid of the competitors. We don't uh, fight with the Ukrainian people. I said that many times before. Ukrainian people became um, uh, hostages of this Kyiv regime uh, that occupied uh, Ukraine, both economically and politically. Over years, they uh, were make, doing everything to um, bring this um, degradation. Nobody cared about people there, and um, in the end they just uh, are using their people. Um, it's very sad, but um, it's true. And um, um, who is responsible for um, this conflict? For it, 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 The responsibility is on the West and, of course, on the uh, Ukrainian elite and their government. Uh, Ukrainian government today does not serve uh, national interests. It serves the interests of the third countries. And they use Ukraine as um, a military base for fighting Russia. I'm not going to go into detail um, about um, increase um, of their actions to build up their um, weapons, but the more they send weapons to Ukraine, the more we will have to respond to the uh, security situation on the borders of um, Russia. That's uh, a natural reaction and response. And they don't even hide their intentions in the West. They say they need to um, cause strategic um, end for uh, Russia, what do they mean? They mean to um, end with us, to move the local conflict into the uh, phase of global um, fight. And we understand what's happening, and um, we will respond to this, because in this case we're already talking about existence of our country, but they should realize that uh, it's impossible to, um, to win uh, against Russia on the battlefield. That's why they use the information um, sphere to fight us. 
And they keep lying. They constantly, constantly attack our cultural values, our um, Orthodox Church. Look what they do to That's uh, Vladimir Putin uh, delivering his annual address to both houses of Russia's parliament regarding the conflict in Ukraine. He said they started this war and we used all our strength to stop it. He also said the responsibility is on the West and the Ukrainian government. Well, let's go to Osama bin Javid now in Moscow. So pretty much so far the defiant combative speech that we were perhaps expecting. Indeed, uh, President Vladimir Putin began by s detailing the inevitability of war as uh, he'd like to uh, tell his people that it is not Russia which initiated this war. Uh, he'd like to tell people that Russia was uh, negotiating in good faith in the Minsk I and the Minsk II agreements, which he says Western powers have now said that they were actually buying time. He accuses the West of uh, uh, going behind, being behind the Nazis, as he'd like to call them. And it was important for Russia to denazify its border. And he's been detailing at length on how the world has failed the people uh, of the world uh, by the billions of dollars, $150 billion, he says, have uh, freely flowed into Ukraine, where only a few hundred million have gone into helping others. So according to President Vladimir Putin, a combative speech, he is coming out as the commander-in-chief of the forces a year after his forces went into Ukraine, a year after Russia has taken over more territory uh, in its uh, west and towards Ukraine. Ukraine's east, and today also marks the day uh, of uh, the, the Donetsk People Republic's uh, uh, referendum, which was called Sham. So again, a, a large audience of 1,400 people uh, in Moscow listening to him, screens uh, put up in all major cities, in all time zones across Russia, so that the people can hear Vladimir Putin come out, defend his operation, tell his people why he had to go to war and why he's not backing down. Okay. Well, Zain. Bazravi is uh, live for us now in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. Uh, Zane, how will the Ukrainian leadership be viewing the contents of this speech so far? Well, as you know, we've been covering this war since day one of the invasion, since even before that. And listening to the speech here in Kyiv, what leaders are also likely to see from this speech is that nothing has really changed. There's been no change of narrative. He hasn't said anything that he hasn't said in the past to try to uh, really validate why this invasion had to happen from the Russian side. And Ukrainian leaders are likely to see this as just another day, uh, just another day of Vladimir Putin continuing to reiterate what are old points. And really, the government here has diplomatically, at least, while the war is still going on diplomatically, this is a very different Ukraine from what it was a year ago. They have really moved on. And one thing that has happened, win or lose, Ukraine now has a seat at a few different tables, at the table of Western allies, at the table with NATO. They're not members yet, but they're on that, they're at that table. And they're at the EU table, socially, politically, economically. Ukraine has pivoted hard towards the West which is perhaps the opposite of what the Russian leadership had hoped to accomplish by this invasion. But that is what has happened. And now whatever happens with the war next, Ukraine is squarely pivoting west. They're at the table with their Western allies. And that's something unlikely to change no matter what direction the battles on the front continue to go in. OK, Zain Brazravi, thank you for that. Well, joining us here on set is Marwan Kabalan. He's Director of Policy Analysis at the Arab Centre for Research and Policy Studies. You're very welcome. Um, Thank you. What has stood out so far for you from this speech? Uh, I think he started by justifying the war because I think the whole decision to go to war was based on miscalculations. First of all, he, and, uh, he overstated the power of the Russian military. He underestimated the power of the Ukraine military. He underestimated the resolve of the, of the Western powers, mainly the United States and the European Union, to stand up against the invasion. And also, I think, he underestimated the will of the Europeans to free themselves from uh, being blackmailed uh, by uh, Russian energy supplies. Uh, so I think all these put together 
is making him now trying to justify this decision to his own people because now he cannot tell the people of Russia any good news about this because this special, what he called special military operation has been going on now for, for almost a year, exactly a year tomorrow. And the objectives have not been achieved, i.e. he couldn't uh, remove the government of uh, Vladimir Zelensky. That was the first objective of the, of the war. He is not preventing the expansion of NATO because, as we all know, it's true that Ukraine is not part of NATO until now, but we all know that Sweden and Finland are going to be soon members of, of NATO. Uh, uh, so I think, I think here he needed, he needed to see something. He needed to say something to the, to the Russian people who are wondering now if the, if the decision to go to war was the right decision. So he said that, uh, he, he was trying to say that I had no option. I was forced actually to go uh, into Ukraine because um, there was no other, no, other, no other way, no other alternative for me. Despite that, I mean, how infuriated would Russia have been by Joe Biden's visit to Kyiv? Would that have increased Vladimir Putin's resolve in this? I think this is what he tried to show during his, uh, his speech, because he said that this, this military operation will continue until objectives are, are achieved or realized. So he must be very furious by the U.S. support to Ukraine. And the uh, visit by President Biden yesterday to Kyiv, it, it, although highly symbolic, in terms of supporting, because the U.S. support has already been boring into Ukraine for, for many months now. And uh, perhaps the, the, the military support that Ukraine received from the United States has never been given to any other country for, for almost since, since, since the Second World War. So I think he is uh, angry, uh, and he believes that the United States and NATO is fighting Russia this is a war by proxy against Russia. He said they are using Ukraine in order to weaken Russia, in order to attack Russia, and this is something he will not tolerate, according to what he said today. You were in Doha a year ago, just before Russia's invasion on a special panel. Could you have imagined where we are today? I think from the very beginning, it was, for, for many of us, the decision was not the right decision, because some actually believe that the Americans who have been expecting uh, the, the Russian invasion since last year, actually. They have been preparing their allies in, in Ukraine to, uh, to confront uh, the, the, the Russia. Uh, although the, although, although uh, also the Americans, they did not actually expect the Russian military to be as weak as it appeared in the, Russia, in the, in the Ukraine um, uh, uh, theater. Uh, of operation. So I think some of us, we were already talking about miscalculation by the Russians. Maybe if they, if they kept threatening, using force could have been much better for them than using force itself. Because most of the time, if you threaten by using force, uh, it will, you will have more perhaps influence and pressure on your rivals than using force itself. Now, now Russia used force actually and the West tested Russia. The West knows now very well the Russian military capability. And here, here you go. I mean, they are doing everything possible in order to defeat Russia. And according to Emmanuel Macron uh, yesterday, to defeat but not to crush Russia. So here is, the, here is another miscalculation by President Putin concerning this whole conflict. OK, my one camera, stay with us. We're going to go now to uh, this story because China's top diplomat is in Russia to hold talks. But Beijing says it's deeply worried about the escalating conflict in Ukraine. We will continue to urge peace, promote talks and provide Chinese wisdom for a political solution to the crisis in Ukraine. Together with the international community, we will jointly promote dialogue, negotiate and address the concerns of all parties and seek a common security. In the meantime, we urge certain countries to immediately stop fueling the fire, stop shifting blame to China, and stop hyping up Ukraine today and Taiwan tomorrow. Well, and Kabbalah, what's China's role in all of this then? Could it provide some kind of peace plan or, or just inflame matters? Uh, if you remember, Ken, last, last year, uh, before the invasion, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Vladimir Putin visited Beijing and he met with uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese president. It was during the Olympic Games 
uh, just a couple of weeks before the invasion of Ukraine. And many were actually wondering whether he informed the Chinese leadership about his intention to invade Ukraine or, or not. The Chinese, they are, of course, I mean, denying that they, they have been informed by the Russians about this. But since then, there has been uh, many questions about where really China stands concerning this conflict. Are they really supporting Russia? So far, the U.S. saying that the Chinese are not trying to, to provide direct military support to the Russians, but they are buying uh, Russian oil and Russian gas. And we all know that um, uh, the, uh, Russia has more than doubled its supplies of oil and gas to the Chinese, and they are selling them at a, a reduced uh, uh, price. Now, the Americans, because of the recent tension between the United States and Russia, uh, between the United States and China, China, uh, because of Taiwan and because of the recent uh, spy balloons, uh, which has been shot by the U.S. Uh, uh, a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of days ago, uh, the, ten the high tension with the Chinese is leading the Americans to believe that that might bring China even closer to Russia uh, concerning the, the war in Ukraine, because the Chinese uh, are not really. Uh, they don't really want to see Russia defeated in, in Ukraine because that will leave them alone facing the United States. Um, now, Russia is relying more on China. Russia is becoming a junior partner for the Chinese. And the Chinese would want actually to have now perhaps some sort of a peaceful solution to this conflict rather than seeing Russia defeated in Ukraine. Okay, Marwan, thank you. You mentioned uh, America there, and in fact, 